Battle Line Podcast, episode 73. Really excited to have Shannon Rich coming on. And for the new listeners, I'm Ian Scotto. I am the Tonto Chris Peronto. <laughs> and yeah, every week on here, we interview different, you know, inspirational figures, whether they're faith-based or athletes or authors, journalists, uh, you know, really from all different walks of life and people who have gotten through tough times through perseverance and faith and, uh, you know, just hard work. Yeah. Uh, and like Shannon will have on today, sometimes we just get knuckleheads on that like to get beat up in the face. You know, just get <laughs> fit being a you know, 50 year old, almost, he's almost 50, I think. I, mean, might I think be. he is 50. I think and he's he, the same age as you, which we'll and, get into. And he's still a bare knuckle boxer. How that's just, I know, and I will get into Shannon and what he's about. I've known Shannon for years. Him and I worked at Blackwater, and I can tell you that dude's head is like a brick wall you cannot <laughs> you cannot do anything to it uh but but he's also extremely brilliant too so yeah. we'll, we'll get into that now but yeah good good intro ian and and uh hope to have some more guests coming on here in the next year or so yeah we have a lot of great people lined up so before we get into everything fort scott munitions who's been with us since the very beginning is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass cnc spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. And it was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring they receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Now, there's been a big update at Fort Scott. Uh, they've been in touch with me. They've probably been in touch with you. They are no longer selling ammo on the site. They just can't, they can't keep up. So go to your local stores that sell ammunition. They're still selling them there. But if you want to uh, order any merchandise from the site, they put out some great apparel and stuff like that. You could still do that at fortscottmunitions.com. And there you could use our exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to our listeners. So promo code BATTLELINE at fortscottmunitions.com. F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com. Except no imitators. But uh, yeah, if you're getting ammo, you're going to have to go in person because there is just, we've been talking about it for months, a massive, massive shortage. Yeah. yeah. And you know, if, if you want to do, a, you know, get it in your local stores, that's probably your best bet. Go to your local ranges and tell them to contact Fort Scott and, and have it start to, if you don't already have it in your local range stores or your local Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's or so forth, go in there and, and tell them, hey, get Fort Scott munitions on the shelves. Because once you shoot it, guys, and uh, I'm telling you from shooting it for years, testing it, uh, whether it's shooting it in gel blocks or, or just into vehicles on the range, this stuff is extremely effective. And for hunters, guys, I'm, I'm telling you, and you can see from their many YouTube videos, you will not be disappointed with their ammunition. That stuff, uh, that stuff has tremendous knockdown power. And, and again, it's Fort Scott, small town, 2000 people, tremendous company, tremendous ethics, and they're honest. I mean, hey, you can't sell it anymore. And they write up front about it. So get it in your local stores, guys. Go tell your ranges and your and your stores in town to start shelving, for, uh, start putting Fort Scott munitions on the shelves. Absolutely. So Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, <laughs> Battleline Tactical, and the Battleline Podcast. With that, let's go. From Omaha, Nebraska to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Switch is on. Motherfucker, I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. <laughs> You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast.
The Switch is on, Battle Line Podcast. Uh, you know, it's funny, I don't know if you saw this just this morning. Uh, my friend Mark with his new uh, thrash metal project, uh, Electrocutioner, which is a great name, uh, they you know put up a little demo of the guitar riff for their song, The Switch is On, which was <laughs> inspired by the podcast and your story from Benghazi. I'm, I'm excited to hear the final product in was the riff good though i didn't hear the riff. oh it sounds good no, i could probably pull it up on here real quick i'll do the riff yeah, I, they no, tagged I, us I, in it uh, I, I think it sounds awesome uh, uh, i i I, I haven't been on social media this morning i had a it's meeting fine, man. Morning, uh, yeah. here we go <laughs> oh that rocks oh yeah Yeah, so he, I mean, he told me he was going for like old school mega. That is, that's what it that's sounds like. Perfect. That makes me want to grow, regrow my mullet and my rat tail and start headbanging again, dude. That is, that's what I was going to say. It sounds just like, like something you found from Mag Megadeth or Iron Maiden or, oh, just, just hammering it hard. That's perfect. Dude. I, I had the, I had the horns up <laughs> rocking out. I mean, you can see it's so perfect. I can't wait to hear it too. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. excited for it. I mean, originally Mark just liked the catchphrase, the switch is on. And then he told me he pulled up one of your speeches talking about the Benghazi attack. And he said, I want to make the song about that. So that's what the lyrical yeah. content will be about. That's an honor. That's, um, that's honestly, that's another thing that is humbling and, and, you know, I'll tell him, especially when we get him on the show, that how that's an honor. I, I and to and it and it keeps the you know with all that uh, with the the hardcore stuff the, the the all the stuff that goes on and then all the politics that go on with with, with surround nine eleven, um, stuff like that is what keeps the memories of of the guys that died alive. It really does. It keeps the memories of Rowan and Bub and Ambassador uh, Stevens and Sean Smith, which it should. Because uh, heroes never die unless you unless they're forgotten, and, and I, I'll be honest, I don't think we're going to have that problem. I don't think they'll ever be forgotten, at least not in my lifetime. And that that's to me that's that shows them that we're honoring them and their sacrifices. So yeah, I hate to bring it. I'm not trying to bring it on a downer. No, no, no. I think that's a positive. I, the I guy's agree. still doing that. So so that's amazing. So uh, yeah, we got to send that to Cheryl Bennett. We got to get Cheryl Bennett on the show. Tyrone's mom. One of these okay. days, but yeah, we got to send that to Cheryl. She'll love it. Yeah, I'm sure love it. She'll just, I'm sure she'll be head banging, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm excited for it. Um, you know what? I, I want to get to you know your 50th birthday and everything, but we did have an email here. We'll get to this first from, uh, from David Eden. He's written to us before, I believe. Uh, sent to Battleline Podcast at gmail.com, and it's a good question for you. Um, he said, as ever, the show is going great, guys. I love the intro and outro. Thank you. Well, the intro is courtesy of uh, Puddle of Muds. Why am I forgetting his name now? I'm, I'm Jimmy, Jimmy Allen. Jimmy, Jimmy Allen. Allen. Jimmy, Allen. Allen. Dude, Jimmy, Jimmy Allen. Jimmy Allen is a he's a, dude. That dude rocks, too. He's oh, Yeah. yeah we we got to get Jimmy back on the show again, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. And Jimmy Allen is, is also from Against All Well. I just, you know, there's been so many guests. You got to forgive me, guys. Sometimes I draw a blank quickly. And then the outro is Mark Slaughter, Debbie or Sean doing the narration on both. So got to shout them out. Um, and he says and it's an interesting mix of guests. Question for Chris. You know what's funny, by the way? This happens all the time. They are fans of yours. Read your books, but they you probably see it all the time. Spell your name C H R I. Yeah, I, I just tell people, hey guys, I spell it like a girl. Okay, it's with a K, <laughs> so just don't. I I, just, I don't spell it like a dude. And it was a great character builder growing up, being called because it's Christian is my full name, but they'd see the K, and every time I would get in a new school because we moved three or four times, I was always Kristen at least for the first month because that's my attendance because everybody thought I was a Kristen. It's like, a, isn't so, it? Uh, more a Latino thing because the only other Chris I know is Chris Ortiz, who is Latino, who, who did stuff with me at Dostra. I think my no, I asked my mom that I did because my mom, yeah, for those of y'all that don't know out there, my mom is Mexican, straight up Mexican. Garcia, you know, I speak Spanish a hell of a lot better than I do. Um, my middle name is Joaquin, I'm named after my abuelo, my, my grandpa. Um, but I asked her, she goes, No, she just wanted it to be different. It's like, Oh, okay, mom, that's cool. And that was that was her answer. So, um um, yeah, I, I don't think it is, but you do see a lot of Latino or Spanish with the K with the, with you do. Yeah. That's the only yeah, other one I yeah, know. So yeah. anyway, getting to the actual question, uh, do you know of anyone or has it ever, uh, happened to you where in the middle of a gunfight you have had to switch over to back up iron sights on your rifle? No, it's the cool thing that every civilian sports shooter seems to want on their rifles that primarily use a red dot or holographic sight. I wonder how often they're actually needed in a real situation. 
Thanks, Dave Eden, uh, Osh Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. Sure, sure. You seem to have answered that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you, Dave, if you just had a video, you'd see me shaking my head. Very, <laughs> very rarely, and I think most guys would say very rarely does it happen because you you do want optics that aren't going to break on you, that aren't going to lose that dot. So they're, they're when you and not saying they all work this way, but the contracts that I worked on and the units that I worked on, they were heavily tested, and when something didn't work. But honestly, you shit can that company and you found somebody else. Um, now, it's, I know what you get. Well, it's government. It's the lowest bidder. I didn't see that in the special operations units. I saw that we got pretty dang good equipment, a lot of good equipment. And if stuff didn't work, we found somebody that would get it to work better. So, um, but that being said, it is smart to have them on there because you need a backup. If it goes down and you have no optic and you have no iron sights, I'm telling you from experience when that's happened, and that's just been in training. It's never happened in real life. It's happened only once in training. You literally cannot hit the broad side of a barn <laughs> without that dot from about five meter, 10 meters on out. So it's good to have it on there. But to say that, oh, yeah, your optics are going to die. Your optics are going to, no, and that's not the case. But you do need that backup. You always need a backup. You always need to have a secondary plan and a tertiary plan. So definitely. And I, I like spikes. I like spikes, tacticals, um, a backup iron sights. I know a lot of people use Magpul and all this other stuff. I think spikes make the best backup sights on the market, and they're extremely affordable. So uh so um and and spikes doesn't sponsor us guys so i'm just putting that out there spike but um no I, I i do recommend you have backup iron sights you don't have to put them on the side like a lot of guys do they do in the movies you got those angled backups but if you like that that's fine there's nothing wrong with it but it's not necessary just put a backup iron on there and and get it zeroed and then it's there if you ever need it but no i've never had to and i would think you probably talked to a lot of guys out there that never had to as well but it's a good feeling to have that option and just in case they do because if an optic does fail a red dot does sell fail you're you can't hit anything it's it's extremely extremely difficult just to shoot past 10 meters and be accurate gotcha all right well there there's your answer any other questions you can always send to battle podcast at gmail.com i thought that was a good one so yeah. we'll get to them when we can uh and hey i i, I do have to mention the big 5-0, you just celebrated your 50th <laughs> birthday. How does it feel, man? What did you do? Spend time with the family? I'm yeah, no, it was good. Um, let's see, I had a I have to had a week. I, I got a great, I got a pretty good wife. She's 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 actually pretty, pretty good. Pretty takes care of me and a good family. Um, but it was no, it was, they took care of me the whole week. Got breakfast, you know, had they made breakfast for me, which normally I just have coffee and peanut butter toast in the morning. That's just my thing. But they made breakfast for me and and then it was just spending the day with the family. And they took me to a movie. They took me to see the new Tom. Our theaters are open here. Um, yeah, yes. I think they are here. I just are think they? that they've been pretty empty. And they, they 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 do like they do limit the seating in them, which I I honestly I like that. I like having it's not like a lot. private deal. <laughs> yeah, it is. But um, I, we saw Tom and Jerry, the new Tom and Jerry movie, and I liked it. And it was for the kids, and it was clever. Uh, I, you know, and I grew up on Tom and Jerry, and it, it, it was too. yeah, it was it was it was fun. And uh, and then of course we had dinner together. It's just spending the day. I mean, my wife went for a run, which is that's our thing. You know, we, we went in for a run together, and it was sixty five degrees. I think on my birthday here, so it was nice, nice. going from minus eighteen to sixty five. So, and it's been a good week. So they've basically been just taking care of me this whole week because I'm getting old, man. Bones are <laughs> bones are getting brittle. So yeah, it, it, and I think that's the best way to spend a birthday is with people that that you love and that love you and. And the movie thing, that's, uh, you know, Ian can attest to this. I'm a big movie, but I love movies. That's oh, all yeah. I really love watching. And be, I love going to the theater, especially, and it was like a matinee. You know, it was like at three o'clock in the afternoon. I think I love matinees because it reminded me of being a kid. We used to go pay 25 cents or, well, that's what I did, <laughs> or a buck and go to the matinee. This is where I saw, we talked about Johnny Dangerously last week. That's where I first saw Johnny Dangerously was at the local movie theater. Well, they, you know, they just had the single movie theaters, not the movie plexes. And going to the matinees, and they'd always—I don't know if you mentioned it on the show. I think that was just from a phone call. Maybe that was just a conversation. <laughs> but, but um, it was—it it was fun. And and the 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 plus side of these new movie plexes and the things they got out is the dinner theaters, and they have more food and stuff. I think that's kind of cool. So yeah, we we ordered like a platter and had pizza and burgers and fries and 
And, and, you know, and it's, it, that's, that's the one thing I do love about the new movie theaters that are out there, like with the lounges and stuff. I do enjoy going and having somebody serve you dinner or lunch or whatever at the movie when, when, you know, it was just popcorn and, and, and Pepsi back in the day. So, um, yeah, it, it was good, good day and, and good week so far. Was Tom and Jerry, like, uh, I'm wondering, was, was it, uh, true to like the original cartoon. Like if you like the original cartoon, yeah, you're gonna love this. Or? It, it, they they didn't talk. Yes, yeah, so, you know Tom and Jerry don't talk. They don't at all. They but it was it was true to them. They're the, and they asked Spike the dog was on there as well. They did it. They 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 modernized it a little bit because the music was uh, honestly the music was actually good. It was back the '80s R and B, the '90s R and B. They had Jodeci. Oh, cool. Jodeci was playing on there. You know. Like it or not, R. Kelly was on there, but hey, he was back big in the day. R. Kelly and public I'm surprised they did just because of how <laughs> I know because he is. Um, but you know, the old R and B that I grew up with when I heard Jodeci, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, they're playing Jodeci on this is freaking fantastic. That's probably I, I feel like a little like nod to the parents who are going. Yeah, right? yeah, it, like all right, it here's is. something for you. It is, I think, because that's what it was. It wasn't any a lot of the newfangled stuff that I think is crap. But that's I think that's how old when you get older. But it was a lot of the old art, old school stuff. But it, the the cat and mouse chasing, helping each other, and then in the end, you know, a happy ending at the end. Um, yeah, it was it was good, dude. It, it was good. I I, I mean. You know, it, it's it's Hanna Barbera, so that's that's, and I think they modeled it off Hanna Barbera, and and uh, and um, yeah, I think those who love Tom and Jerry are gonna like it. But you know, it's put in a setting like, did you ever see Who Framed Roger Rabbit? When yeah, that first, you know course. that you've got the real people with. Oh, the okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, so so or or like Space Jam, or like Space Jam. Yes, there's another one. Um, so they, uh, but it worked. So uh, I, I liked, it. I was like at the beginning, it was a little bit, ah, this is kind of weird. It's not really Tom and Jerry cause it's not just a cartoon, but then as the storyline kept going, they did a good job uh, on it. Uh, I, and, uh, I laughed, I laughed and I smiled at the end of it and everybody was happy and the family was happy and the kids loved it. So I was happy. That's cool, man. I mean, because there are kids' movies that I could watch again and again, but there's like something in there for everybody. Like yeah. the original Ninja Turtles, I could yeah. watch again and again. I could too. Um, you know, <laughs> some of them I feel like are strictly just for kids. Like I, I actually went to see before, right before theaters closed, I went to see that Sonic the Hedgehog movie. And I was like, yeah, this is clearly for not, like, not for my demographic. And I was hoping there would be like a little nod to... <laughs> my demo because we grew up on Sonic. That's why I wanted to see it. It, it was, was it was it was really aimed towards I don't know ten year olds. I agree. Year old. I I agree. I, I watched Sonic at the theater too, and it was okay. Jim Carrey did a good job being Jim Carrey, that old Jim Carrey that you remember yeah. from In Living Color days with the. But yeah, really, it was like man, this doesn't remind me of the Sega Genesis video yeah, game yeah. at all. And I, I like uh, aside from the coins, but the uh, the the rings where you had to collect the rings, but. Yeah, I agree with you, bro. I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, that's cool, though, man. I mean, 50 is is a big milestone. I, I feel like uh, I already know the answer to this, knowing <laughs> you as well as I do. But, I feel, you know, we always talk about sometimes, like, the steroids and HPH uh. stuff. And, but I feel like 50 is the age where it's acceptable to actually go on hormone replacement therapy if you want to. I already can see you're like, nah. nah. Yeah. I, I just, it I would just, be understandable. No one would fault you for it. You no, know, at that age, just those levels dip. You do, and you do. You, I, I saw it there and I did. I actually was starting to experience it because I could see the muscle tone and stuff. But then I, I just told myself, okay, I'm going to have to work out harder. And that's what I do. I, I, I work, I, I go run, you know, me and my wife ran three or four miles that day outside. And then I come back into my gym and I run sprints on the treadmill in between doing workouts. So I'll work out for another hour. And, and, uh, it is, it, you know, to me, and for those that, for those y'all that listen back in the nineties, I, I sold steroids. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. I did. I, I actually applied for uh, the F when I was working for the agency. I applied the FBI HRT. It wasn't me. They actually came and said, "Hey, do you want to join HRT?" The, the big eight has, and I applied for it. And I went through the FBI process. This is why I was working for the agency as a contractor. And uh, and um, at, I there's two different hiring if you go for HRT back back in that day. It was anyway. And I'll, I'll hurry up here. But um, you applied for the HRT, you went through their hiring process, and then you had to go through, of course, the special agent hiring process because you had to be hired on both sides. HRT flew through it, fantastic, got through it, was hired. 
I got a contingency offer letter to be on the HRT team. Then I had to go through the uh, FBI special agent hiring, which I flew through that. And then I got to the polygraph and they said, well, after 1991, did you traffic or sell an illegal substance? And then it says steroids be became steroids counts after February 2nd, 1991, as it became a uh, control substance at that time. It said on the, the way. And I said, yeah, I did. Actually, I sold it for two months after that date. And I admitted during my polygraph and they looked at me like, you, you did. I said, yeah, this is a polygraph. I'm telling you the truth here. It's on my SF-86. And, and they're like, well, um, since you admitted to it, you can't, you can't be a special agent. I was like, well, all right. And I, I lost my, you know, I lost the chance to be on the HRT team, which was fine because I just went right back to working for the agency. Agency didn't care. They're like, ah, we, we don't care. Just, yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, Getting into steroids, I was around, sold it, used it in college a bit. I did. Um, and I know that that stuff can really hurt you. I had buddies that slammed. They were using it on the football team. We were on, I was one of the best junior college football teams in the country. We were a division one power, uh, you know, pipeline to, for, for division one colleges to come and recruit at our, our, our college. We were ranked number one in the nation my freshman year and number two my sophomore year. I mean, we were awesome. And, but I guys were using steroids and I saw guys go from 150 to 230 in a year. And I stayed in touch with them. Every one of them, back problems, colon problems as far as having colon cancer, yep. um, losing hair. The stories about what we call, we call it, excuse my language, guys. Gynomastia. Gynomastia, yeah. <laughs> we call it bitch tit. Is what we used yeah. to say. That is true. And I was like, no. And I got off it. And from then on, I'm like, I am not touching this stuff because- even though I know doctors can can give it to you, it's, it's yeah, it's changed a lot. Yeah, it's changed I mean, because now there's legal, you know, yeah. th there's places that specialize in it. I know just from like the fitness industry, like Titan Medical Center in Florida, and there's all these places, you know, and they're they're not gonna go crazy with it because it's a prescription. It's a prescription, and there are guys my age and younger. You see these like fitness youtube influencers who are 20 on hrt yeah. and i say eric fingers quotes because it's bullshit there if <laughs> hrt means hormone replacement therapy what are you replacing at 20 years old they're, they're, unless you have something very wrong are, with you but it, exactly. but at 50 i think it's appropriate and that's I, what, I might do it at 50 i don't know it's i got 16 years till then i think i just have that that stigma of i worry because of what i saw and i did do it back when i was in college i was 195 running a four four five forty. yeah i was i was very <laughs> Some of that was steroids, but I saw what it did to my my guys after, and it left a bad taste in my mouth. And to me, it's just, I'll just work harder. But that's not saying in that maybe when I'm 60, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. But you know, I, I'm the same as you. I see guys, especially on social media, the younger guys, they abuse it and say, "Yeah, oh, no, I, I'm just taking <laughs> hormone replacement." There, I call it I call it male hormone therapy. It's like horse shit. You're taking steroids. You're taking human growth hormone. Just, hey, just say what. Just be honest. Yeah, just yeah, stop. I, I agree. So I'll stay um, off it for right now, but I'm never going to say, yeah, if a doctor said, you know what, you need to take it. And if my wife says I need to take it because I'm not keeping up with, <laughs> keeping up with her. Um, yeah. Then I will, <laughs> then I will take it. But in the meantime, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing just fine in the, in every part of my facet of life. But when we get Tanya on, maybe, maybe it's a question you want to ask her. <laughs> I don't know if we can get Tanya on. Every time I ask her, she's coming on. She's like, yeah, we'll, I, I don't really want to come on. We'll, we'll she always says she's shy to do like media, you know. She is. She she hates. She doesn't have social media. She hates social media. She doesn't like going or coming on, but she will. And that's a question we do need to ask her because she'll be honest with you. Where maybe I need her to. Be, maybe she'll be more honest on the show than just telling me that I'm doing okay. Where it's like, no, he needs to go get on that. <laughs> he needs to start <laughs> taking mean, nutritics. People loved the first episode that she was on, so I mean, I we'd have her back anytime, but it's it's up to her. You're, yeah, it is. Yeah, we, come on, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got Shannon Rich coming on. Before we do, we have an excellent new sponsor that I'm so excited that we have on board. Uh, a lot of you guys, whether it's for getting up in the morning or going for your workout, need that caffeine fix, and this is a totally new way to do it. Do you prefer a shot of espresso to start your day? Well, you need to try out Steam, an authentic espresso, strong, smooth coffee crafted by forcing hot steam through finely ground coffee beans at high pressure. Steam espresso is 100% espresso, non-GMO, and organically farmed. Steam is an artisan espresso, never mixed or mass-produced, 
and it is shipped right to your door, available in select retail locations. It's a simple twist on the classic favorite, espresso steeped in raw cacao and triple filtered for a smooth chocolate finish. Lightly sweetened and just a few grams of organic cane sugar and loaded with beneficial antioxidants. And they even tell you where the espresso was harvested, which is where I could throw in. I'm not Latino like you, but I'm going to do my best here with the pronunciation. So the current harvest comes from the Finca Nueva Esperanza farm. You like that there, Excellent. right? Excellent. Dude, you've got good, the roll. That was from, fantastic. From, uh, Chiapas, Mexico. Yep. And uh, you can discover a newfound focus and energy as you start your day with steam. Please do good and not evil in three easy steps. Discover a newfound focus and energy as you start your day with steam. One, ask yourself, what will I achieve today? Two, drink steam. Three, go out and do it. So I'm really excited. I mean, this is, yeah. it, if you're someone who needs to go to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts before your workout or in the morning, you can just get it done quickly at home without even having to brew coffee. So this is a really cool uh New product, and from where they're where they're uh, farming it at, and getting the the cocoa, has got cocoa cocoa beans. I always say cocoa, but I know it's always, <laughs> but it, it that's tremendous area, and they make great coffee there. That it's that's fantastic. Great new sponsor, and I, man, I, I'm I'm honored that they're part of the show, especially me being a coffee holic like I am. Absolutely. So to try for yourself how good espresso can be, go to trysteam.com, and that is T R Y S T E A M M. Dot com. Again, go to trysteam.com, T-R-Y-S-T-A-M-M.com. You guys are going to love it. So joining us for the first time on Battleline, Shannon Rich, MMA fighter, bare knuckle boxing fighter, firearms instructor, and security contractor, uh, runs Canon BJJ out of Glendale, Arizona, currently doing some acting gigs. So you do a whole lot of everything, and yeah. it's an honor to have you on, man. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, you know I'm a big fan of uh, Chris Pronto, and you know uh, we're we're friends. I am too. We are we are <laughs> we are friends, we're but man, friends, I'm, dude. I'm, I'm still a big fan, man. The, oh, guy's, dude, the dude. guy's a hero, and uh, he he needs those accolades because you know guys like that is is what keeps dude, us going. Yeah. Guys like you that can take a punch at 50 still, bare knuckles, that, that's the accolades right there, dude. But I know you, dude, I know you, you've always had a solid chin. I've always <laughs> known that. You, you, I was like, man, who do you want on your team? I'm going to take Shannon and, and Garland. I'm going to take yeah. Jindo and the cannon because yeah. I know they're going to be able to get shot in the face and they're just going to shrug it off. So like, keep oh, on going, dude. huh? <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to see you, brother. Yeah, it's, it's good it's, seeing you too, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. an honor to be here, man. I mean, uh, this is awesome, man. It's cool. Oh, yeah. Well, tell us, you know, people that don't know you out there and, and you'll get in. What I'd like to get into is 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 if initially first is is like you're coming up, man. I, I really want people that know your background and not the fighting part, which we're going to get into because we want to talk about your fight coming up. But just how the hell did you become what you are? I, I mean, even parts I don't know before. I mean, I didn't know you before contracting 2003. Right, right. I didn't I didn't know you. So right. a little bit of that. And and uh yeah, I, I just just so people can people can get to know who the canon. Well, I knew who he is, but who he really is. Well, you know, I came from a small town. It was uh, kind of like Leave It to Beaverland. I lived in uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally lived out in the cotton field of Coolidge, Arizona. I mean, it was a super small town, but it was very uh, uh, it, was, it was a rough town. And I was literally had to be the smallest kid in school. Um, I weighed eighty five pounds as a freshman wrestling at the high school, and uh, oh, and uh, you know, being a small kid, I got picked on, and uh, I became you know bullied and kids bullied me and so that's why i'm such an advocate against anti-bullying man because i i just i, I it, it got to a point one time where you know i was gonna commit suicide um wow. bullying is it, really bad but you know i came from a small town and uh Wait, well, i'm just what why were you bullied i was a small kid in school i was an easy target you know i weighed uh, you know 85 pounds on everybody else walking around 140 150 so you know hey let's pick on the small kid and you know, i got shit for being skinny and, so I, and, I relate to that and to be honest you know i probably I probably <laughs> big mouth and uh, I, probably I, yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. I can't say that I didn't deserve it. So I mean I probably did. I was probably that kid that you know just would fight anybody, but you know I got beat up a lot. So I mean that's why I got into that, and I got into martial arts, and that that kind of changed me. Then I got into wrestling, and wrestling changed my life. I mean, uh, if it wasn't for wrestling, who knows where I'd be right now? You know, in, in my small town, you either grew up and you worked for the prison, or you grew up and you became an inmate. So literally. You, you had two choices. You were going to either work at the prison or become an inmate. What did I do? I ended up working at the prison and uh, yeah. did that for about five years, worked in the maximum security prison. And then I got out, joined the military. Uh, after I got out of the military, I, 
I just started doing contracting work and, uh, and during that whole time I've been fighting, you know, I've been fighting since 1991. So I've got 30 years in the professional mixed martial arts world. And, uh, you know, it's time to probably say goodbye to that and, and go into a different venture. And that's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm taking a page out of, uh, Tonto's book. There is, uh, you know, teaching shooting, you know, I, I got some carbine classes, some pistol classes. So I, I started doing that. And then, um, and acting, you know, I'm just trying to trying to get into Hollywood, break into Hollywood. You know, I got it. What uh, I'm just what, what branch of the military did you? Do? I, I was in the army, man. I was no big. I was no big deal. I wasn't a ranger like this man right here. I was uh, I was in the fourth ID. I was a fourth infantry division, and I, I was an air conditioning repairman. You know, so that's you said that, that, that that's the weirdest thing. You know, I, when uh, I found that out, but found and for, was that at Fort? Were you Carson? Fort, Fort no, I was, at, I was at Fort Hood. That was that was. Oh, your uh, hood. They, yeah, hood. They they went from Carson to Hood, and then they went back. So I I was at the Hood 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 time. That's even hood. tough. That's tough living too, there, man. It was, uh, man. I joined. You know what? I joined the military, <laughs> honestly, to get out and go see the world. And I got stuck at Fort Hood, Texas. <laughs> That's the word. Yeah, I, you're saying about athletics. I, I, in growing up myself, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have as rough, a, rough a childhood as, as, as you, as you did, of course. But athletics. And it's sad that you see some schools getting rid of athletic programs or athletics or, or you know, we've got the, the locker room talk and, oh, my gosh, we can't have that alpha male mentality. Mm -hmm. But athletics really wasn't that. It was a way for people to and kids ourselves to start finding some structure in our life, man. And, it's, and it's the bonding. Like, the bond, the bonding, yeah. you, you, you bond with people. It's like in a military boot camp and you knew bond with those guys, you're friends forever. You, you go down range with somebody, you're going to bond. You can be friends forever. Just like in a wrestling team or football team, you bond and you make friends that are, you know, it's lifetime, yeah. lifetime friendships. You learn how to be miserable together during the train ups when the season starts. And, Absolutely. And, and then you learn how to lose together. You learn how to win together. And I, it's, it's, it's sad when I see that, when I see programs in schools starting to talk about, and there are some that are starting to limit their athletic programs because of, especially on the, on the men's side, because all of this, this, this uh, toxic masculinity, you know, it's not that at all. In fact, it's, 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 it's a way for guys to come together or just anyone to come together, team to come and, and and learn how to interact with each other learn how to fail together but learn how to pick each other up it's it's that teamwork aspect that you find wrestling is huge on that even though it's individual wrestling is is a huge team sport because man when you guys i and i i, I played basketball i was a wuss i didn't wrestle but uh, uh um but you know going getting into and a wrestler when i was growing up as a youngster but just seeing that and going to the wrestling matches and seeing how it really was a team sport yeah you're on the mat by yourself but that's even more pressure because everybody's watching you, but seeing the team cheering you on, if you weren't on the on-deck circle warming up. Sure. Um, I, I, I would, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the wrestling and, and the kids out there about the importance of, 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 the, of, of high school sports. Sure. And you know, I, and, and I take that and I, I break it down cause I own the uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school. So I teach kids uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And my main thing that I tell the kids is, you know, you're not always going to win. And it's great when you win. I mean, I mean, heck, who doesn't want to win? You know what I mean? Everyone wants to win, but you got to be a good loser. You got to know how to be a good winner and be a good loser. And if you can learn how to lose and accept that and be a good sportsmanship, man, that you, that's lifelong lessons that I like to teach kids. I, I, I think it applies a lot to what we see outside in society today. We, we don't get into politics a whole bunch, but... I tell you what, it, uh, we've lost the ability to be good losers yeah. and good winners to be yeah. to be good sport. The sportsmanship aspect, which is where we got it as kids in sports growing up. So yeah, if, if we lost, Chris, we knew we not accept that. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but was your dad a high school football coach? He was high school, and then he was also a college football coach and a Division One. And um, he also coached me in my senior year at a, when he 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 became a college football coach at Colorado Mesa. So he. I grew up around, that you know, and this is big mentality. Big, and, yeah, the mentality, the, the yeah. football mentality, the mentorship. The, yeah. the guys like Mike Holmgren. I don't know if you know who Mike Holmgren is. He, no, he was won the, won the Super Bowl with the Packers, the head yep. coach for the Packers. He was yeah. the quarterback coach when I was growing up at BYU. Lavelle Edwards, Norm Chow, who was the offensive coordinator at USC when they were national champions. You know, and growing up around Jim McMahon and Steve Young and those guys. It, 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 it's watching those guys and handle adversity as a youngster. Right. fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth grade and then seeing how they handled success as well which everybody except for probably jim mcmahon who was always outspoken but the rest of the guys how they handled it with class 
it, it, and, it, and you know, and not every and not everyone does that. You you get these guys that sometimes they get that success, it goes through their head, and they forget where they came from. And yeah, hey man, that's a that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> oh, it, it is, it is. But but you know, I, the wrestling aspect is immense because wrestlers to me, whenever I watched them, they went through hell. Dude, I'm going to tell you, right? I you know, I've done training with everybody, and and I'm going to say tr- wrestling was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, besides any of the the, the the training that I've done, wrestling is literally the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I think if you if you can wrestle and you can go through a practice in wrestling and make it through the whole season, you can do anything. You can do anything. How, how much weight did you have to cut? Are you, I, or you already- I was so small, I didn't have to cut weight. <laughs> and uh, and then my like my senior year, you know, I cut like 15, 20 pounds. Not bad, not bad. Wow. wow. That's it. Just 15, 20 pounds. That's, yeah. that's oh my. And then MMA, you know, I used to cut 20, 20 pounds on in 24 hours. So <laughs> how, you know, I, getting in and moving up, how, how did you know, the army and you being in the H HVC, how did you get into contracting? I mean, that's where I met you. I met you at Blackwater. So, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, so that's an interesting thing. You know, I, I, I got out of the military. I, I started doing executive protection. I was doing that. And then I got a, a, an email and they said, Hey, we're, uh, there's a company, Blackwater USA. Uh, they were they were needing some some uh, some guys, and when I went, there was like I don't know 112, 115 guys trying to trying to get into that group of 12 because they were only going to select 12 guys, and I was one of the guys. I I literally had some Navy SEAL sniper instructors on my left, some Navy SEAL sniper instructors on my right, and I outshot everybody on the line. And they were like, "Who's this guy? This this is this is a fighter." And, and the, the, Shannon, who are you? Are you working for the CIA? Are you a spook? <laughs> Who are you? Are you special forces? And I was like, dude, I'm just a fighter. And they're like, no way. But I grew up shooting. You know, I've, I've been shooting my whole life. So um, just naturally gifted shooter. And, and, you know, I, I made it through Blackwater training. And they, they said, hey, we'll give you a job. And I ended up being on the Negroponte detail. And I was on the ambassador's detail. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's where we were hanging out. And, yeah, you know, everyone, I still think they were like, this guy is somebody else. He's not just. He's not. <laughs> he, he's not just who he says he is. He's somebody else. Were, so were the guys that you were? I, I'm just wondering. Were the guys that that were in that you know training process with you? Did most of them have combat experience? Because correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like your prior military experience was not you know in combat. Dude, my prior military experience was nothing. I mean, I I was no I was nobody. And uh, the, I mean, obviously that got me in the door to Blackwater. But other than that, I, I I did nothing in the military. I didn't do any of the cool stuff until after I got out. But but um, yeah, man. Everybody that was at Blackwater at that time was ex. Uh, you know, they were all tier one yeah, yeah. guys. Um, they were the, they, they were the best of the best, and and you know I was I was lucky, and I say that at this time I was lucky to be part of that group because at that time Blackwater was the 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 stigma was you, it was a cream of the crop you couldn't get there and be at that position unless you were somebody and you know I just got lucky. That must have stung for like the Navy SEAL snipers when they're like, "This guy outshined yeah. me." Hey, it just is it's, what it is, man. Hey, shit! It shit happens. Haters are gonna yeah. hate, man. Yeah, what, haters what gonna hate. Yeah. Hey, now, now I can't remember. Did did you go through the? Because that's was that when the academy? We had, remember we had that Blackwater Academy. So guys right. that yeah. that didn't have the special ops didn't have the years to meet the requirements no, they would send them through the I, through the blackwater academy no it wasn't the academy i mean we were at we were at in moyoc we did go through the yeah. uh, refresher the, type thing where the we train up, yeah. yeah we did the train yeah. up and but yeah. i mean when you got there they expected you to know how to use an ar-15 that you expect you to know how to use a pistol and they wanted while well, we had to do the driving course but that was the only thing new to me but um yeah, man, some of the cool stuff that I was just kind of watching and trying to pick it up as we were going in, learn how to clear a room and you know, that kind of stuff. I had never done that before. And I was, I just picked it up. So you know, I was, again, I was lucky. I was do, lucky. Do, do you think, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I have strong faith. I know that you have, you have faith as well, but do why do you think, did you think there was a reason that you were going down that path? Is just what you wanted to do? Or is like, hey man, it, I it just is. fell into it. Okay, let's make the best of it. And let's just be the best I could be at it. Even no, though it, I'm- I mean, obviously, you know, uh, the the Iraq War and and nine eleven and all that happened at, during that time, and you know, I, I'm a patriot, big time. I mean, you know that I'm a huge yeah. patriot, so uh, I definitely wanted to do that in the military. I didn't have time, I didn't have the opportunity, I should say, to go down range and be a true soldier, and so this was my opportunity to try to uh, be a soldier and and give back to the country, and you know, that's that's what I thought I was doing, and. Uh, that's that's why I was there. You know, did you have a? Ch- I had a great mentor too. I mean, did you have a chance to spend time with Mongo? Oh yeah, come so, on now. Yeah. So so Mongo. Uh, I mean, Mongo, rest in peace. But I mean, uh, amazing Navy SEAL. If anybody doesn't know who Mongo is, but Mongo took me under his wing, literally, and 
dude, I mean, he mentored me and, and it, he made me, man, he made me who I was, you know, if it wasn't for him, I, I wouldn't have had the opportunities I had. So, and I think that's why also that, that, that you stayed and you did well, even, even without the, the background per se is because a lot of those guys didn't want to listen. I remember coming in and being, you know, you and I was in charge of the team. I had an excellent team, but we also had guys every once in a while that didn't want to listen. Right. They knew it all. Yeah. And, and like, no, you don't know it all. Just yeah. shut your mouth and, and listen. And the guys that could listen, we didn't care about the backgrounds. It was like, okay, he's here. He's listening to what we have to say. All right. I want him on my team because he's going to do what I ask him to do. And he's going to be part. And, but it comes back to that team aspect again. Yes, exactly. He wants yeah. to be part of that team. You know, you, I, you know, I'm coming back from that team aspect. So you have a coach and my team leader was a coach. You know, he tells me what to do. And I just listen and do what he says. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And Mongo, yeah, rest in peace. Mongo passed yeah. away a few, a few years ago. Um, but yeah, no, I remember, uh, I remember coming into a, uh, coming in and we were actually trading off. You guys were leaving a venue and my team was coming into a venue. And I still remember, and I, I Shannon, I shook my head at this Mongo. It was ministry of interior in Baghdad. And he uh -huh. was, uh, uh -huh. there's this block block wall and he's standing up on top of the block wall. So everybody can see it. And I'm like, Jesus Mongo, gosh, doing a back just, just, just tell everybody we're here. I mean, just let her. <laughs> and I remember looking at a Spino in the back. I go, is that Mongo again? I was like, yeah. I was like, son of a bitch. We get him off that damn wall. But did, that was Mongo, dude. That was did, just how he, he was. Did he do a backflip? He didn't do, you know, because he was kitted up. I mean, oh, okay, all his kid on. He was, he was always, you know, he was always going around doing backflips off everything. <laughs> that guy's a nut. Yes. Yeah, good guy. Well, tell me, what, what, you know, what you did, I know you were fighting during those contractor days. And, and I, like I told, I told Ian with guys like yourself and Royce and, and Espino and and Garland, and then we had Little Lizenby. I felt uh, Ian hasn't watched the movie yet, but you've seen uh, uh, you've seen that Lee Marvin movie, um, Dirty Dozen, right? Yeah. With the, yeah, yeah. I was like, man, I felt like Lee Marvin at the Dirty Dozen with all these guys around me, all these dang criminals and hardheads and trying to get these. But but they were. But it's like, man, these guys would do anything. They would they would take a bullet for every one of us. And, and Absolutely. It, but. When you were fighting, how did it continue to morph into like you're continually going now? So can you lead us up until those days contracting what you kept fighting and how you stayed yeah. in the and it's bare knuckle? It's not you. Yeah, yeah. You're fighting yeah. bare knuckle. Well, you know, I did do MMA. I'm I, I am an MMA MMA fighter. Um, black zone yes, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, kickboxing, but bare knuckle, and that's a whole nother that's a whole nother level. And you know, I'm I'm 26 and three, 26 wins by knockout, and. And I'm a current BKFC uh, heavyweight world champion. I'm getting ready to go November. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. June 5th in Norway, I'm fighting for Ragnarok. So, you, you know, I'm going to go fight for a world title, represent the United States. And, uh, man, it, it's just, okay, so bare knuckle boxing. It's, it's precision boxing. You have to, I mean, it is boxing. There's no kicks, no elbows, no punches, no takedowns. It's just boxing, but man, it's pure because it, it's just this, man. You put this on somebody's chin, <laughs> it's either you <laughs> knock him out or he knocks you out. And and that's my philosophy, and that's the way it's always been for me. And, and hence, that's why I got the name The Cannon, because I get shot out of a cannon, man. It's like as soon as they say go, we go. And uh, I go as hard as I can for as long as I can, and I'm going to give you as much as I can. And it's either you knock me out or I knock you out. And that's what the fans want to see. So that's what I try to give them. And that's how my career has lasted so long. Uh, by no means am I the best fighter in the world. By no means, am, I'm, I'm not even up there. But I, I do have a lot of fights. I'm ranked number two in the world with the most fights. Um, have over 236 professional MMA fights. And uh, obviously 26 and three with bare knuckle. But man, that's why I get keep calling back because I might not be the best fighter, but man, I'm sure exciting. People like to watch that. Yeah, so do. Yeah, and you you guys are the same age. Like, what motivates you at 50 to what say I'm still going to do this? Turn. He just turned. <laughs> I just turned 50. <laughs> 50 man. This, this guy's a baby. Well, you're both 50, right? Yeah, or yeah, am I wrong? Yeah, both 50. He's got he's got me by a few months. Yeah, he's a little bit old. He I mean, he has look how much more gray he has than me. He obviously is older. Hey, he's obviously. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I've earned that. You <laughs> notice I don't have the mohawk anymore. I I, uh, I, uh, I, I rocked the mohawk for for almost twenty years, but for um, long. But but you know I'm doing the movie thing, so they're like, hey, you got to grow out your hair, grow out your beard. I I just shaved my beard, but um, they were like, grow, good, out, yeah. grow out your hair, and you know I was like, all right. You look well, nice. good, yeah, yeah. What 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 uh, motivates that to to say I'm still gonna do this at this point? 
Well, you know, it's always testing myself. It's it's not about well, it is about the money. I got to say that too. But, um, <laughs> you it's, you it's, make hard a to, yeah. it, it's hard to turn down the money, but man, it's really about t- testing yourself. It's like I'm 50 years old fighting guys 25, so literally half my age. And how can I how, how can I you know measure up against these guys? And <laughs> some days you win, you know. Some days you're the hammer. Some days you're the nail. But you know, it's 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 definitely it's self-satisfying to be able to say, Hey, you know, I'm out there doing this and, uh, getting the opportunity to do it because at 50, I mean, come on, not, not too many people want to watch an old man fight, but they still call me. They still want to see me fight. So it's it's how old is uh, your opponent on June 5th? I think he's 32. Dang, bro. So he's, he's, but he's not even in his prime. He's a young guy. You're in your prime. You know, there's a, there is a true saying about man strength. When you get man strength, Hey, that's I think you get man strength around forty. You start getting forty, forty five. You get you you get stronger or something. I don't know. You ca- it's called that. All I call it the redneck farm boy strength, dude. It's just that 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 throwing hay bales. Yeah, you're hurt. You know, wrestling steers, and uh, that you get that strength. And it is. It's it, you're right. You're right. Is that you can't you can't get anywhere else but just life. It's just life. Life gives. When you first went in, and I didn't know when you first went in. When you first went in. What what pushed you? Because I yeah, and I didn't mean to 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 say you don't do MMA UFC because you have, but what pushed you for, away from that to the bare knuckle? Because because well, I didn't know that. Here here's the here's the real reason. When I first started MMA, it was 1991. Okay, so there were there were no rounds, no weight classes, no gloves. Um, it was literally no rules. The rules were you can't bite and you can't eye gouge, and now and that was pretty much it. So I'd go down and I'd go down to Mexico. And we'd fight. They'd have the chicken fights. They'd have the dog fights. And the people would fight. That's literally how I got started in bare knuckle MMA. And wow. uh, I was really good at it. Uh, I mean, you, you put the gloves on and then you got the limited rules. Well, okay, I'm not the best. But bare knuckle, that's a whole other story. So now, now we're doing bare knuckle. I was doing it. And there were some illegal fights. So obviously doing these bare knuckle underground illegal fights. And then all of a sudden, BKFC, this guy, this promoter came out, uh, Dave Feldman, and he gets it legalized. He has a... The boxing commission actually sanctions bare knuckle boxing. So there's like four states right now in the United States that we can do this. It's legal in London. I got I fought in the O2 arena in London. Um, we we can go now go fight in Norway. We could go fight in a couple other countries. So now bare knuckle is this new brand new sport, and it's the most brutal, most uh, I'm going to say intense. If you haven't watched it, go watch a couple bare knuckle boxing fights, man. They it's exciting. You get two minutes to just beat the crap out of somebody with your fist and. Uh, <laughs> And it's it's just awesome you know it's five two minute rounds and uh man it's just it's just non-stop action so i mean to me it's the most extreme fighting allowed by law and uh i'm really good at it so i i, I just love it <laughs> really, really i just love the, it. Uh, yeah love the that. name sounds familiar is is dave feldman the guy who's on howard stern pretty often and does the celebrity uh boxing stuff i feel like that's, i know the name that's his brother his brother does the celebrity oh. boxing I was like, yeah, I yeah. know it's because I yeah, knew yeah. I remember the name yeah, his, Feldman, his, and he's yeah, always on. And Howard kind of like Howard makes fun of him. All yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the last family. celebrity boxing was like the uh, the bagel boss guy here on Long Island yeah, who yeah. bailed on the fight. Right. Uh, yeah, his brother's the one that got into that. But his dad, I mean, he comes from a long line of boxing promoters. His dad was a boxing promoter, and then uh, Dave got the first uh, bare knuckle boxing sanctioned. And you know, we all gotta go to him. Because if it wasn't for him, he w- would still be doing it illegally, and uh, that's not cool. But but now he's got a sanction. It's on pay per view, and uh, now Florida's blowing up doing it. I mean, there's a couple other bare knuckle boxing organizations popping up, but uh, this Ragnarok, it's out of Norway. It's going to be the biggest, best bare knuckle boxing organization there is. Uh, the guy Stan, who's the promoter for it, he's uh, he's treating the guys really, really well. He's uh, treating you like a true professional, and uh, you're, you're going to see a you're going to see you're going to hear about this bare knuckle boxing out of Norway. It's really good. And I, I've watched it, you know, because you, you watch it and people are, oh, bare knuckle box is brutal. It actually is, is officiated very well. Oh, I mean, absolutely. yeah, I mean, the, the, the UFC ones and twos, I thought were more brutal than as far as uncontrolled. I mean, when, when a guy's knocked out and he's down, you don't see a guy jumping on him unless it's just extremely angry, but you still got officials in there breaking that stuff up and, and I want people to know that because you're going to have nation. Oh no, it's too too brutal. No, it's it, it's brutal when they're fighting. Yeah, but there, I, I haven't seen. No, I'm you've seen a lot more than I have. But the ones I've watched, it hasn't been to the extreme where it's like a dog fight. 
Mm-hmm. Where it's like, okay, it's it's to the death. It's not. It's not excessive. You, it's not excessive. No. I mean, and the referee is right there. Um, you got Dan Margiela yeah. from the UFC. He's one of the best that's, UFC that's, refs. Yeah, that's Dan, who it is. Yep. Dan goes out there and he, he man, he he separates you when you need to be separated. Let's put it that way. But he lets you fight. No, that's, that's good. It's good to hear because again, I want, I do want people to to because it, it is exciting. It, it remind it, and and honestly, I've I, of course watched your your I've watched your highlight reels too. I see them all the time. I'm always following you, man. Appreciate and, it. Uh, yeah, you, you got to watch this 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 guy with that doesn't have a mohawk anymore. Well, I'm gonna come back a, with the mohawk for this. Yeah, time. come back. Yeah, mohawk and, coming back. The other good thing about bare knuckle boxing is here. Pull your pull your ear pull your headphones off. Let me see your ears. See, he's still got normal ears. We don't have oh, call wow. of, we don't we don't have call of After all those ears <laughs> I know he's got normal ears. So I was like, yeah, that's bare knuckle boxing. Save, save your ears, man. So you yeah, don't yeah. look like a, a cauliflower on him. Yeah. Um, Hey, g- coming up, you know, and, and you you grew up in uh, there. You grew up in Arizona, south, in South Arizona. You're yeah. down down yeah. by the border down there, right. and, and you know it, it, it can get pretty rough. But you grew up rough. You you've raised rough. You know, I when I knew you, you were always professional, but you always could tell that Shannon was ready to go if he needed him. <laughs> but no he problem. was always always professional, uh, you know. And then throughout with the uh, with with the bare knuckle boxing, it got you in skill set, which. For those oh, yeah. that don't know magazines within the community of bare knuckle boxing and fighting skill sets like, yeah, there it is. It's like the, the, it's like what recoil is for the gun world. If you, and given recoil. So, um, tell the people a little bit if you can about the, the article and then, well, you know, how do you get in, how'd you get in skill set in there? Cause that's a, and you got a big ass cool. layout and you got, yeah. me, and you yeah. put my picture in there with you. Look, Thank you. The reason Thank I got you. in skill set magazine was because of this picture right here. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> and for the audience, it's you with Chris Peronto. <laughs> yeah. Me, me and Chris Peronto. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I go to the shot show every year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, oh yeah. yeah. Fan of the shot show. Actually, you and I've talked out there several times. Um, I got uh, a good friend of mine from POF. Uh, he was the owner of POF and uh, Frank, he, he knew the guys from skill set and he introduced me to them. Uh, rest in peace for Frank. Cause he just passed away too, about a year ago. Oh, I um, that. Oh, yeah. He's the owner of POF. Yeah. He passed away. It was a wow. car wreck and uh, yeah, he passed away. But um, anyway, Jason from skill set magazine, we got to talking and he's a jujitsu practitioner and he likes jujitsu. I like jujitsu. We actually live really close to each other here in Arizona. And he's like, Hey, why don't you come in and we'll, we'll get you in a magazine. Well, he had me on his podcast that blew up. That was really good podcast. And, uh, and then he brought me in for the magazine and, uh, yeah, that's how it went. It's just a small world, you know. Everyone knows everybody, and uh, and uh, I I always think that you know it's it, it's nice to be important, but most important to be nice. So if you're nice to everybody, I mean, yeah, there's some there's some there's some good things that go around. You know, karma is real. Karma is a real I, deal. I agree. Real I thing. agree with you. I definitely agree with you there, brother. Um, fight coming up, but we, we can talk a little bit more about the fight coming up. But I I just I want to get into more if we can your background. Uh, the, with the kids, because I know you're a big proponent of teaching kids, and you said you're a big proponent of anti-bullying. We we got, we got into it, then we skipped away from it. I I, I do think we have young listeners out there, um, and they need to know what adversity is, but they also need to know, you know, uh, well, my guys like my, yourself. My thing is, you know, what I try to tell kids: I go out and do anti-bully assemblies all over the country. You know, I go and talk to the big schools, small schools, rich schools, poor schools. It doesn't matter. You know, I just talk to kids. And if I can just get one kid to tell me, Hey, you know what, listening to you helped me because that's, that's kind of what I'm going through right now. Then, you know, it's all worth it. Um, I try, I try to tell kids that, you know, the, the word of the day is, uh, uh, integrity. You, you have to have integrity. You have to have, um, uh, you, you got to have these basic things of not being a snitch. They kids, kids nowadays think that if you tattle or you tell on somebody, you're being a snitch and that that's not what it is. What, what it is, is you have to have you have to have the uh, adversity and, and you have to be able to tell your mom, your dad, your teacher, your, your, your classmates, you got to be able to tell them, Hey, this is what's going on. Somebody's putting their hands on me. Somebody's doing this. And, and, uh, you got to be able to let them know. And, it, and it's not snitching. You know, that's not, that's not the, that's not what it is. It's, it's about, you have to have the, the adversity and to tell somebody, you got to say, Hey, somebody's putting their hands on me and they're picking on me and I don't like it. And, uh, you know, it's big right now is, uh, the cyber bullying people get on the yeah. cyber, you know, they get on social media and, you know, 10, 15, 20 people attack this one person. They feel horrible. They, they can't fight everybody off. And so they go and they commit suicide. And 
that you know we got to end that we got we got to end that suicide and we got to end in the uh the uh, the veteran suicide man this this whole thing about people killing themselves and feeling down about themselves getting into this depression uh they get down in this rabbit hole and they can't get out we got to help them and uh that's 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 what i want to do i want to go out and talk to kids and let them know that hey there's there's a there's something you can do about it i was that kid that was going to commit suicide because i was getting picked on and look at what i've done with my life you know, if you just make choices, you know, you have good choices, bad choices, but it's all about making the right choice. And uh, if you can be a mentor, you can go out and help kids. That's that's why I'm here. And that's what that's what I really like to do. And being a Brazilian jiu jitsu instructor, I get lots of kids, lots of families. And, you know, obviously, I'm you know, I'm not the best role model, but I at least try to be a role model. And I, I try to tell people, hey, this is what you can do to change your life, you know. Well, it takes courage, man. It takes courage, and, pe and people think physical courage is 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 the hardest thing to find. Like, and right. physical courage would be, hey, if you're going to get in a fight or you're getting shot at, do you run at that threat? Really, it's moral courage is the yes. hardest. Absolutely, and that's that's bit, that's having the ability to go and say, hey, there's somebody picking on me, or having the moral courage to do the right thing when nobody else is looking. That's mm -hmm. integrity. And, and 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 I think we've got our country has gotten away. A lot of it has gotten away from that moral courage where we can make mistakes or I shouldn't say mistakes. We can do the wrong thing and we can personally do the wrong thing and nothing's going to happen to us. And nobody's going to say anything about it. Nobody's going to speak up. Or if they do speak up, there's repercussions because they've spoken up. So they fail to still speak up, which is, again, now we're not having moral courage. I, I completely agree with you, bro. I, I, I think having the ability to tell the kids it's OK. You know, it's okay. I, and that, and okay that's what it is. It's all about being okay. You know, and like you said, courage, that's the word of the day. You got to have courage. You got to be able to tell your mom, your dad, your teacher, somebody that, Hey, you got to have the courage to say, Hey, this is what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and not worry about what people are going to think about you. Absolutely. Or, or, and, and yes, of course, there's always repercussions for everything. Uh, there, an action, there's always an immediate reaction to it, whether it's good or bad, but that moral courage is where it starts. And if you continue to internalize it, that's when, that's when that's when you kill yourself. That's when you start thinking about the suicide right. because I'm I'm helpless. I can't do anything about it. No bullshit, yeah. you can't. You yeah, can talk do something. to somebody. You got to talk to somebody. Let let them know that hey, this is why I'm I'm going through. And then you know what? You, you never know who you're going to talk or who who's going to come yeah. into your life and things happen. Man, the big things. I happen. agree, man. I I've even said you know at my darkest times in life, I had to go for a walk with like my best friend and talk about things. And and I think oftentimes you think people are going to judge you, but if if someone is your good friend, I you know I, I consider Chris a good friend. If if I had something I was going through, I know you know Chris will be there for me and and not be there to criticize me for something I did wrong. And and I think oftentimes we think yeah that our friends or family are going to uh, have negative feelings if we went through something. And and usually they could they could relate more than you think. Right. Yeah, you do, the whole thing about being judged. I mean, no one, no one wants to get judged, and and I think that's that's one big thing that you know you got to let people know that hey, we're here for you. Yeah, and or you just be like me, and you don't give two shits what people think about you. Can you tell me? And I I wanted to always know because I know Shannon now. When you were growing up and getting bullied, because I do remember my high school days. I was actually that bully. Be honest with you, I was that bully protector. Mm -hmm. I was the kid that would step in. And, and and stop the bullying. I remember stepping in and stopping a kid getting beat up by this guy that was bullying him. And I maybe that was why I went the route I went in my life with, with protection and security. But um, would, was there ever that point, and I think our young listeners would really benefit from this, where you had that, uh, what do I do? I, I Okay, I, I got to fight. I got to fight. But mm -hmm. where you were at the lowest point that you didn't want to be here because you talked about a little bit, how did you get yourself out of it what did you do? What were you thinking? I, you know, there's a time in, in everyone's life where you have to make that decision. It's time. Enough is enough. I have to defend myself. And I had that breaking point my senior year of high school. Um, I came from a real Christian family where my mother, she said, hey, you know, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Don't ever get in a fight. If you end up getting a fight in school and you get suspended, you're going to be in a lot more trouble at home. You're going to have yeah. all these stores. <laughs> and then I was so scared of my mom. I didn't care what happened at school. I was scared of my mom. Um, but, you know, it, got, it came to a point where, you know, I had no choice. I had no choice. Uh, I was surrounded. The kid was picking on me, and I had to fight back. Um, uh, I'm not going to say I won that fight, but I did fight back. And you know what? After I fought back, uh, that kid never messed with me again. And so the, the, there's, there's a thing that, you know, maybe you're scared. You're scared of fighting. You're afraid of what's going to happen. You, you're going to either get suspended. You may get hurt. You may break your nose. I mean, there, there's all these fears. But if you stand up and you 
and you just have to do it one time. Just stand up for yourself. And you may have to punch somebody. And but after you do it, I guarantee you it's like turning turning over a new leaf. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna feel so incredible. It's like this big weight off your back is lifted, you know. Hey, I got my first fight and uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey man, no, people true. know, but, but people know they say, "Hey, you know what? I watched him fight back. He he fought back, so he's not an easy target anymore." If I would have learned that when I was like in third, fourth grade, I would have never got picked on. But I waited, and you know, I was always that guy that was an easy target. But but finally, my senior year, I I fought back, and uh, no one messed with me ever again after that. So and, 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 not, it's just and that you're one right. Time. It's your right. I, mine was in third grade where a kid was picking on me and I punched him in the nose and it never, but it was early on. I, yeah, and, and everyone knew everyone that saw yeah. that goes, Hey, don't <laughs> mess with <laughs> the, the thing that that's hard though, with, with that kind of stuff is, uh, is not as we, we got to, because kids, kids where we used to settle things with our fists. Now they settle them with guns and they settle them with yeah. weapons. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I you know, it, it is, it's gone to that route where this is the route that's gone to though. Now, yeah. I had kids are afraid to, Hey, well, he's, I'm going to get shot or there's going to be retribution down the line, whether it's a, a and you know, and that's a, that's a country that's, but I, I think the that's a country where we need to fix ourselves. We need to get, we need to figure out where it's okay to get. I remember getting in a fight with a guy and we were, we were best friends the next day. Oh, and you I, know, that happens it, with guys, you know, guys end up fighting and then they become best friends. It's, it's and crazy. I, thing. I, I don't know. I think we need to get with the country. It's it's okay to disagree. It's as kids. It's a, it's okay. We used to fight, but taken to that extreme where where guns and knives get pulled. And I guess my my question to that is, why do you think it's gone that way? Where it's gone to that extremes now? Where where kids where we used to settle stuff with fists, it's now settled with with a weapon. And sometimes and a lot of times it's settled with guns and settled as a retribution, as a drive by or some other altercation. Uh -huh. Where, where, I, where people get 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 killed. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I just know that people's values have changed. I'm going to say that the people's home values are a lot different from uh, you know the 70s and 80s when I was growing up to the 20,000s, like where we are now. Uh, people's values are changed. I mean, it's, it's it's all about the people and how they grow up and how they they uh, they raise their kids. Well, my, my my opinion, put I think you need to put, and this is my opinion. I'm being being a very, very a Christian, being a terrible Christian, but I am. Um, I, I, I honestly, I saw, I to my, I saw it when you started to take, you started to take, remove God from schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you started to remove virtue from school. Mm -hmm. Where now we need to have our own laws and man's laws, and no, the, God's laws is what we need to follow. Having virtue, being virtuous. Not saying I always am, but. I remember that when I was growing up in school, it, I didn't go to a private school either. I went to a public school, but still it was, oh, did we, we did, we had prayer in the morning and, and like the pledge and, of allegiance every and day, pledge of allegiance every day. And I think virtue has gotten pulled out. Um, mm -hmm. This, the, the, I watch movies all the time. No country for old men. My favorite line in any movie is when sir, ma'am disappear, the rest are soon to follow. Well, that is what I remember, sir, ma'am and God and all the, all the discipline started to go away. Well, this is where we're at now. Um, but but I, I just want to ask your opinion on that because I know you're a fighter. And But I, I love what you said because I think a lot of people can get out of what you just said is just stand up for yourself. Just so once. You I mean, if you just, just did up. it one time, you you probably never have to do it again. And, you know, in, in my jujitsu school, I always tell my kids, hey, I don't ever want to hear about you guys fighting in school. I don't never want to hear about you fighting. But if it comes to the point where someone is literally putting their hands on you, I don't want you to be a victim. I want you to fight back. And that's when you got to fight back is when they literally have, you got no other choice. There, there's just no other it's choice. Last option. last option, defend yourself. And, and, and it's good. And, you know, that's, well said. that's pretty much the same thing in contracting as well, man. Defend yourself at the last resort. Well, it is. It is. Well said. Well said. Well, speaking of the contracting world, I'm sure the audience is going to want to hear since you guys were in that world together. You got to have a good contracting story between the two of you from from your time together. He was, dude. He was extra. Out of all of us, I was probably more unprofessional. He was a professional contractor with Negger Pawnee. I remember Negger, and he was just he was just business, dude. He was business, but I was also one of those guys that would saw him. And and again, I, I relate you and Jindo together because you had those crazy eyes. Yeah. Were like the crazy eyes guys that there was something different, different. And I never, uh, but I, I always wanted him on my team. So I, I really, there was nothing crazy he ever did. Do you have what, a funny, what? do you have a funny story of the Iraq times? Do you, do you remember going to the palace and watching the guys uh, swimming in Saddam's pool? I mean, to me, that was 
that, that, that was a little strange because here we are in the middle of the war and we were doing 24 on 24 off on yeah. the, on the detail. Yeah. And, and then on your days off, you could either go work with the QRF guys with you and, and do this kind of thing. Or these guys would just go to the pool and they would be drinking their beer. They'd be riding bicycles off the high dive into the pool. Dude, I remember, I remember with Logan throwing the damn air KBR air conditioners off the diving board. And yes. I, so yeah. it, 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 we had funny night nice stories. Just yeah. Nuts. Just, nuts. just it, out in the middle of this war zone, you hear gunshots going off and, and mortars coming in and people are swimming in this Olympic sized pool that Saddam Hussein built. <laughs> Just and then we, we had that one. We had that one night where that damn State Department. It wasn't a contractor. Oh, there was yeah, a yeah. State Department agent brought out absinthe. He brought out the, the and guys were drinking it because they didn't know what it was. And that's when Logan was up on the diving board taking the KBR condition air conditioners, and they were tossing them off the pool. And I remember that night. I don't know. We don't know what it was. Whether it was a rocket or RPG, something shot over the pool. Nobody took cover. Every it was like everybody it was like everybody went, Oh <laughs> yeah, bro, party, yeah. And everybody just started drinking. I mean, the early days it was. It was the freaking wild west. And, it was and, and, the wild and west. but the thing with Shannon is is you look at him now and you would think he would be in the middle of that. Shannon was the most so he was the most professional, and, <laughs> professional and, guy. And never and, drink a drop of alcohol because I don't drink. And and a lot of people look at me and they're like, Oh, he's got a mohawk, he's got all the tattoos, <laughs> he's a crazy guy. Never drink alcohol in my life. Never. Never. Is is there a story behind that? Because I don't I don't personally really drink much either, but I, I definitely did I, at one point. I think you know to never pick up alcohol well, is the, I'm literally, the discipline. I'm literally a control freak, and I don't want to get out of control. And I'm Native American, Irish, and German, so I mean that's just not a good mix. And and I like to fight. So if you put alcohol in me and and get all that, I'm, I'll probably get a little wild. <laughs> That's so good. Your self control, and that there that that's actually was Shan was Shannon downrange too. He had a lot of self control. You don't you don't have to worry about him shooting indiscriminately. You don't have to worry about him taking overboard, even though he could. He was kind of those guys that was from the great philosopher Patrick Swayze. That was be nice until it's time to not yeah. be nice. <laughs> Wrote out. I, I'm it, just a dude playing another. I'm, dude. Oh, that's me. That's me, dude. <laughs> playing the dude. This guy's another dude, but um. I, I that's a it's it's what's because you would think out of all the guys I work with it'd be that I'd have a crazy story with Shannon but my craziest story with Shannon was just when we were hanging out at the pool and doing stuff after after which was just crazy in itself because it's surreal because you got a damn rocket that bounces off and doesn't detonate 100 meters from the pool but then also you know he he was actually the most sane out of everybody there I, I hope that doesn't offend you but no, I thought I was like no, man this dude's the most this dude's probably the most reliable guy here and and I appreciate that. Uh, yeah and, and but it, it also says a lot for the special ops guys all losing their minds over there but now you got this they heating did. and air guy that that really if you all depends of purposes didn't qualify for the contract but fought his way to be on it and he's actually the most dependable guy there I was like I would sit, brother. I would sit and watch on the stick on the pool around the pool. The stair that we had, we still had the, uh, we still had the picnic or the uh, the layout chairs because they still right. had places because yeah, the yeah. the State Department women that were there and came, they would want to lay out during the day. So they, but I remember sitting and just watching every all the chaos ensue on the pool. And I remember watching. I'd watch Shannon, and Shannon was just being Shannon, dude. If he was even there, if he wasn't already in his bed or wasn't at the gym. He was, yeah, I was at the gym like, a lot. So. What, everybody was doing crazy shit. No, I was like, yeah, okay. And that's when I started to notice him. It's like, why isn't this guy acting all nutbaggish right now like everybody else, even though he looks probably like he should? <laughs> He's not. And that's when I started to figure out who he was. Uh, and that was like 2003 or 2004. Yeah. It was right around that time. Yeah. 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 So there you go. There you go. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so there, there you go. go. Yeah, I mean, I, I I trust uh, what you say, Chris, and that sounds <laughs> awesome. And, and I can tell you're a disciplined individual, and that's why you're still able to do what you do. Uh, I guess last thing from me, what were you saying? Sorry. I, I was going to say two things real quick. Chris, I got to ask you because I got you in front of me, and because usually when I, I, I talk to you, man, you got 50 other things going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talk. But the movie 13 Hours, yeah, how, yeah. How, how, how accurate – was that movie to how it was in real life? Was it Hollywood? Did they Hollywood it up or no? It, I, no, the, the, no. Actually, it was very. It was very accurate. I, I the the explosions and things like that. Does it look most of explosions? Whether we even before, even before Benghazi, you saw two hundred three hit. You saw RPG hit. It's more of an implosion. You see the flash or the boom even during the day. You'll see boom, 
and then it then it's not a blast out. It's more of a I mean, it's just carnage. It's just like, bam, it hits, explosion. You feel the sound wave. If you're close enough, you feel the shock wave. You hear it. And then you see the carnage or whatever happened to it. It's it's like, it's like. But pretty, you, you much, almost, the, almost that, that, but pretty much the story and the actors, yeah. they, they, they got it right. They did it very, very well. And the, the actors, I have a lot of positive things. Pablo and I are still friends to this day. He did an excellent job. He got, we're, we got to know each other. Same with the other guys on the video, on the film. And I know we've, we've never talked about this, right? <laughs> Shit. Um, um, that Michael Bay did a very good job getting the storyline, the timeline, everything right. The, the drone footage. Um, the guy that played like, you, literally, that, that was Chris Pronto. That was Tom. That guy did a great job. <laughs> Pablo did a great job. He, and he's, but he's a monster. I mean, he's huge. He's a lot bigger. Obviously, you know that. He's a lot bigger than my little ass. Um, and then the guy that played Boone. Come on, man. The size different. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Boone's like five foot five or something like that. But, yeah. but the, the personalities and, and just the, just the, 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 the interaction between us and the family, the short little family clips, clips. Those were perfect. I mean, they were spot on. And yeah, Tig had just had twins. Yeah. Jack had just found out that his wife was pregnant and he was going through a lot of shit in his head. The real estate business, Jack was contracting him because he had lost so much money in the real estate business. That's why he came over. Wow. Roan was, was his wife's dental assistant. No, I, and the, all the little the nuances were spot on. The Tropic Thunder reference references. We watched that all the time. That's why we threw it in there. The, when, that's, oh, when, that's so awesome. Okay. And and even the little things like after I fell asleep, and I did when the ambassador was talking, you see me walking out eating an apple. I eat apples all the time downrange because it helped me with my Crohn's disease. So I mean, just putting that in there, you see me eating an apple and throwing it. Well, I eat apples all the time. That's why they threw it in there. And also the argument was worth, and you know me, me being a smart ass to the leadership, I had I very zero respect for for that was spot on. So um Hey, yeah, I'm glad you asked me that here. No, that's I mean, good because, the, the, you know, those are some of the things I, re, I just wanted to ask about. And the second thing is, hey, man, shout out to Tonto's Vodka. Oh, yes, you got Tonto. I forgot Tonto's to mention. Tonto's Vodka. Come on, guess, man. That's one of my new guess, sponsors. Guess who sponsors Shannon the Cannon? Tonto, Tonto Vodka. vodka. Absolutely, so, man. But, but you're going to see you that in Ragnarok on pay-per-view. I'm going to have Tonto Vodka on my shirt. You know, dude, that's you, so cool. You're, you're all, and we are proud to have you as a sponsor, man. I appreciate man, it. So. I know. Isn't that we sponsor a guy that doesn't drink? Because that's, yeah, that's, that's, right. that's how we roll. That's how we roll. You're my boy, man. You are awesome, Shannon. Awesome. How we roll, man. So, uh, yeah, the last thing I, I was going to ask, unless Chris says anything else, is, you know, you talked about transitioning into the acting world. Yeah. But what yeah. do you have coming up with that? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So I just did a movie with uh, Michael J. White and Mickey Rourke. It's called The Commando. Oh, wow. And I got to play an inmate, which was kind of crazy. But, you know, I, I played the part well. And then I got to dress up. And, you know, cover my face and my head and everything. And I was an FBI agent. So, uh, you know, that was that was interesting. And they brought me on as a uh, technical advisor to show everyone how to hold a weapon, you know, n nothing in the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. That's the yeah. biggest pet peeve of mine is seeing guys walk around with a finger in the trigger. Man, that's just, that's just uh, silly. Terrible. Mike, Michael J. White, you're talking about Black Dynamite? Spawn? Yeah. Michael yeah, J. Yeah. White? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. That's the awesome. Movie. That's Mickey, Mickey Rourke, him and I had a... a, a uh, a fight scene and then Cowboy Cerrone nice. in the movie as well. So, I mean, yeah, it's really nice. cool. Then I just wow. played a, uh, uh, just got done playing a, a vampire. Actually, I did a vampire fight scene. <laughs> That's awesome. I and, can't wait to see that. And coming up, uh, I'm supposed to be going to Thailand for a movie called MR9, which is a uh, 007 type action film, Mickey Rourke and uh, I forgot his name. Ooh, we're, we're, another guy I, that's I, super, super. I just can't. I can't remember his name. Or, uh, or, or remember, or remember. Yeah, but he's a. So it's a. It's a MR nine. It's a uh, action film. 007. So it's going to be pretty cool, dude. Get and then uh, and nice. I got a couple other big movies coming out. So yeah, man. Hopefully, uh, twenty twenty two, you'll see me on the big screen. See, Those are some big names, man. I mean, we'll yeah. have to have any of them on Battleline Podcast. Yeah, if absolutely. The opportunity ever arises. Sure. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah. When the movies come out, man, we'll, even if we you and bring you and Mickey, I'd love to talk to Michael J. White. That was Black Dynamite was my favorite movie in Libya. I would watch oh, that with Bub all really? the time, dude. Oh, I love Black Dynamite. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach. I'll reach out to Michael and tell him about it. 
And is he, is he, is he, what is his, because he's a martial, you can tell by his movies, yeah, he actually a, is a martial he's a, artist. What is he he's doing? a legitimate martial arts guy. I mean, he knows karate, he knows jujitsu, he knows Muay Thai. I mean, the guy's legit. So, it's yeah, he's a super nice guy, man. Real nice guy. I love to have him on Battle Line, but brother, yeah, I, I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud of what you're doing. And and at 50, you're you're actually still doing more now than you were back back when I'm we were. Trying, man, I'm, I'm wearing a lot of hats, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be like you, my man. Just divert. Got to diversify, man. Got to yeah, diversify. And I got, and I got to give a big shout out to Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb, man. This guy's this guy's on the front line of the uh, the border situation in in Arizona, and uh, I'll tell you what, man. That guy's a true constitutionalist, and uh, he's doing the right thing. Good. I'm, I'm glad. To say, and uh, shout out to all the law enforcement out there doing that are doing good things and and yeah. keeping their integrity and keeping their virtue and and, and still be on the line, man. But proud of you, man. I'm I'm glad you got to come on last minute, and and you you were. I, I've wanted you on for the last couple of months. We just, we were able to get you on. No, I, I appreciate it. For, oh, thanks. Hopefully it's a good show and people are, you know, they're going to oh, like yeah. what we talked about. This no, this was excellent, man. Excellent. So for the audience out there, you could follow Shannon on Instagram at Shannon Rich MMA. And that's R-I-T-C-H, Shannon Rich MMA. Uh, and then if you want to check out the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu School, it's CanonBJJ.net, C-A-N-N-O-N-B-J-J. Dot net and then of course as we said june 5th in norway uh your next fight bare knuckle boxing uh for the world title so look at those guns it's been great having you on man <laughs> great hearing these stories and yeah. and i think for the audience that, that's into chris's work i mean it gets more into like your history and and what you've done in the contracting world so uh yeah and what we'll get we're gonna have shannon as a, i'll get you in as a guest instructor for one of our battle line oh. courses too i know hey, we've been man, talking about that dude yeah, let's do that, man. That'd be great. And if you guys I, ever come out to Arizona, let me know, man. We'll go play some golf. <laughs> you, oh, yeah, I can't. I, I, how, how close is it to Thatcher, Arizona? How close are you to Thatcher? Are you very, you know, Thatcher? Uh, a couple, Thatcher? Yeah, a couple hours. I uh, used to play Eastern Arizona and football down there. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember it's just a beautiful country down there, brother. But, uh, man, tell everybody hi. Tell the boys hi. And, 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 and yeah, I, send me a picture with the Tonto Vodka at, your, at the Ragnarok, uh, man. I will. Send Absolutely. Me. Yeah, I'm going to – I'll have a bunch of them. And if you need some bottles, hit me up. I'll get you some bottles. Uh, I don't know I don't know how we ship to Norway, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, man. All right, buddy. Thank you. Yes. That remi reminded me. That remi reminded me of when I first saw Shannon from across the pool. It's like a it's like a dating movie, right? I saw him from across the pool. But <laughs> I remember we we it, it it was in Baghdad during those early days, it was there was no it was crazy. It was chaos. And it was I mean it was it was like firefights and bombs and shit going off during the day, doing ops and making sure you didn't get shot at or RPG'd or ID'd. And then they come back and just just crazy debauchery at the pool at Saddam's pool. And, and that was State Department, dude. That's that's the, and, I, and I remember that that was like I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what in the hell? I mean, it was fun and I was enjoying it, but it was it's like this is this is State Department. What what in the world? It, it, it was like hedonism in Iraq. And, and but then also seeing Shannon, the one guy again. Where I thought he was an. I'll be honest. I, when I first met him, I mean, first heard about Shannon and other guy. I I nobody really knew much about him and I, I know he wanted to keep his background quiet because he 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 really didn't qualify for the contract and got he was worried I, I don't know if he was worried about it but you know hey seals rangers delta sf and now you got a heating and air guy on this <laughs> but um but it's like that that whole acting like you're supposed to be there type yeah thing. yeah but but also he just he listened and he was the one guy that that uh that that was disciplined out of all these guys that are supposed to be disciplined, this guy was the disciplined one. And I admired that. And it, it drew me to him to find out more about him. And again, hence we became good friends. And I was proud to work with him and, and proud to 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 be to be in Iraq with him. And I always wanted him on my team because I knew that whatever happened, the dude was going to be there. And I, I knew just by looking at him, he had a jaw that could take a freaking butt stock <laughs> to the face and just shrug it off. So great guy. Well, great guy. You guys might remember when we had James Powell on the show, um, which is not his real name. That's a, you know, combination of James Mattis and Colin Powell. But uh, when he was on, yeah, it's a similar thing where he talks about when he was in the CIA and, uh, and it was all Army Rangers and Navy SEALs and and uh, Ivy League graduates. Yeah. And he started to feel like, am I supposed to be here? I was just a Marine. I, I don't know if I'm in the right room. And uh, he kind of learned the lesson which he spoke about. I don't know if it was on the episode, but he's, he's talked about it many times that, 
you know, the woman coming up to him and saying, yeah. like, you look like you're confused. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have those qualifications to be here. And she's like, look, if you're here. You're here for a reason. And yeah. That kind of turned him around. It sounds like the same thing with Shannon. He realized, like, I'm here for a reason. Yeah, I, exactly. He's here and, and he'd made the most of it, too. No issues did an outstanding job and he was always asked to come back on the contract, which again, if, if he was terrible, they wouldn't ask him back. Uh, and, or we have peers, we would have peered him out. We would have said, no, this dude is not coming back. And, and nobody ever said that. He, it was like, yeah, Shannon. Yeah, he's good. Can bring him back. Bring him back. And I assume if you're not someone from your background, you're probably under higher scrutiny. <laughs> you are, you are. Cause and, and it, he is an anomaly, but I'll be honest, nine times out of 10, if you don't have that background, yeah, you you don't have the, the mental state. You you don't have the tactical, you're not tactically sound enough. And that's just from training, not saying you can't be, but we don't have time to train you. You have to be ready to go then. Uh, or and, and then it becomes to the emotional state where, where you have to be able to handle yourself under duress. And if you can't, maintain a level of of calmness when everything is chaotic i don't want you there either because you're going to make a mistake and that mistake could cost me a life my life could cost a teammate a life or you could shoot and cause mass chaos which creates another carnage which i uh, you know, I love the guys at Nisar Square. I'm glad they're out of prison. I, I think they were wrongfully sent to prison. That was the Blackwater team. Yeah. But you can see there because there were some, my opinion, some bad shooting in there where the shooting shouldn't have happened. You see what happens. A lot of people died when it really, to my opinion, and I, I you know, Monday morning quarterbacks always win, right? I'm, I, I am. I'm Monday morning quarterbacker right now. I wasn't there. I've been in a situation similar. But you see where one shot, one, one shot of the gun and it's the wrong time to shoot can lead to just carnage. And if you don't have that mental state to be able to think clearly and calm yourself down into chaos when stress levels are up here, that's a possibility. And who suffers? Well, the, the local populace suffers. Innocents die. Um, and um, again, not to say that that they shot wrongly. They didn't. They, they were under fire. But I, I do think that there there could have been some some. I do think some guys weren't as level-headed as others on that team, and and there was some unnecessary shooting that went on. But war's war. You can't you can't go in the FBI and say, "Oh yeah, they committed murder." Bullshit. That's war. That's just that's war. It wasn't like yeah. they were intending to go murder people. They just thought their lives were in danger. But that's that's the different levels. That is that's regular army or regular military and special operations, and you go through the training to to weed that out. But he wasn't. He was. He was awesome. He, he was. He was. Yeah. Awesome. No, I'm not. I'm not read up enough on the Blackwater stuff. I've heard you talk about it. I've heard others, but I, I haven't really read enough. But it sounds like your perspective is that the punishment really didn't fit the crime. Didn't fit the if, crime. if there even was a crime, if you want to call it a crime. Yeah, it, it didn't. But they're also in the line. You you also know you, you, that's the, that's what we would always warn State Department. That's why a lot of us jumped over to the OGA, the the CIA side of the house. It's because guys were coming in that didn't have the the training to handle themselves under duress. Um, and it's not saying they were, they couldn't have garnered it or couldn't have got it. They were, they were talented guys, but it's, it's, they just didn't have the time. They didn't spend the time to, to get that training. They, they didn't go through all the money that seals and Rangers and Delta and special forces get on training to prepare you for that moment. They just didn't get it. Um, so I got, I, I don't want to talk derogatory about them because they're not, it's just training. You just didn't get, they didn't get the, they, they didn't get all those, all those hard ass training stuff you go through before you get to, before you get there. So you're prepared to not shoot. The hardest thing downrange is not shooting. The hardest thing is to hold yourself back from shooting when you know that, man, I got to protect myself, but this is not the right time. I, it's, I, I'm not sure if these guys are, nope, these are, these are innocents. Nope, I'm not doing it. Yes, my life may be higher in danger now because now I'm not shooting, but I'm not going to have a bad shoot and then try to say, okay, well, my life was in danger, which it was, but, and, but then, you know, create mass carnage and now innocents die. It's a fine line. That's why war is hell. But you, you, yeah, you can't come in with the DOJ come in and say, "Oh shit, yeah, this is FBI." And, oh, bad shoots, terrible. This was all eat shit. You know, I, these guys thought their lives were in danger, uh, and they did what they had to do. The pun, the, the worst that should have happened is they should have lost their security clearances and went back home. 
And now to my opinion, but again, getting back to Shannon, you would think he would be that kind of guy that would lose his head under duress because of his lack of training um, or lack of the special operations training. He wasn't, yeah. he was an anomaly that was, yeah. That dude, and that, I think that goes back to his fighting. I think that goes back to having the discipline as a wrestler, uh, high school athletics, and then also him coming up in the early days of the UFC and MMA. So kudos to him. Yeah. Was he actually, you know, just to clarify, in the actual UFC or just MMA? Just, in, just MMA. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just MMA. No, 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 it's fine. Because I don't think he, because I was looking, I don't think he fought in the UFC. When he was getting into it, that was at the very early stages, I think the precursors of what was now called the UFC, Ultimate Fighting. Um, so we always thought he was, it was, because really us, us ignorance at the time when it was Royce Gracie and Shamrock and all those, we didn't know the difference. We thought MMA was UFC. So if I use it interchangeably, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. No, no, that's all it, good. But, but uh, I, I'm just making sure because, you yeah. know, it's, there, there is a difference. There is a difference. There's a difference between playing baseball and playing baseball <laughs> in the MLB, of course. Yeah. So, so. No, you're right. I don't think he ever was in formal UFC like Andre Arlovsky, our first guest was. You know, Who was he's, a champion. He's yeah. a UFC champion. Um, but yeah, Shannon went into those other underground circles to fight, which to be honest with you, that's more fitted for him anyway. And uh, I'm glad he talked about that because that does exist. Dog fighting, cock fighting, and then human fighting. It it, it exists on the same card <laughs> in some of those places in Mexico. And, yeah, which and, I mean, I will say on the dog fighting aspect, I do that's horseshit. that we don't yeah. see that anymore, man, yeah. because, yeah, when you hear about it, you know, uh, this would be a whole nother subject. But when they talk about Michael Vick, when they say he killed the dog, it's like, no, it's not like he went out there and shot a dog with a gun. They tortured those. Yeah, dogs. They, they those dogs were raped and tortured. You know, they, and then to make them mean, to make them fighters, uh, to get that, to get that instinct of kill that killing instinct back in and it's why pit bulls have that stigma of oh they're bad dogs they're not bad dogs bad people it was bad owners it's always bad yeah. owners. It doesn't matter if it's a shit i've been bit by i've never been bit by a pit bull but i've been bit by no. a damn damn chihuahua that <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> nicest dog i ever met was my friend's pit bull uh, it, it always is how they're how they're raised um uh and it, uh, it comes to the human aspect of it as well shannon shannon could have gone down that route of being a felon and he would have been a very good felon because of his 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 assets and he is a, and his strengths literally um muscular and emotional and mental strengths that he has um and is no he doesn't have fear i don't ever saw fear in him if he does i never saw it but he 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 did have positive things come in after high school obviously he talked about his incident he had things come in his life positively and then when he was with us and I say us, you know, because he did kind of feel like an outsider initially with Blackwater. We all engulfed him with open arms. We didn't care what his background was. It was, dude, he's 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 reliable. Get in here. And I think that helped him continue to be positive. And he still is well respected in the Ranger community, especially by myself and and other Rangers, other guys from the 75th Ranger Regiment that that respect him. And um the, the the cool thing too is as much of a badass he is, he always calls me sir. And even I told him not to stop it, but he's very respectful. It's like how Andre loves. Yeah, so Mr. Just, Tonto. Mr. Tonto. I was like, stop it, guys. You guys can kick my ass three times till Sunday. Just stop it. But he always has that respect, which is discipline, and that's that's admirable, especially with a guy that that is that really. If he didn't want to have anybody, he didn't have to give anybody respect if he was an asshole and he's not he's just a tremendous good-hearted positive individual and i i highly recommend any kids that are getting into brazilian jiu-jitsu go and work with him just because not just because of his skills but because he's such a good person and he wants he wants you to be able to handle yourself and be confident in yourself because he went through such a tough tough childhood as being bullied being so small as as a child so yeah it's great funny to think is a big i know thing, but um you know, that's the last thing we should mention here is that you got a book signing at the Alamo Gun Range, which that's right. Alamo is actually in Naples, Florida. Naples, I love Naples. Yeah. March 13th and March 14th. Um, so yeah. if you're in the area, be there at Alamo Gun Range. Uh, Naples, do you know the time by any chance? Or uh, actually, I'll be I'll be there. They're, they're actually having a big trade show there. They have one every year at the Alamo there in Naples. So I'll be there all day. I'll be there pro uh, just to be safe, let's say 10 to 4. But uh, yeah, we'll put it there. So I don't want people showing up super early and, oh, he was supposed to be here at 9, 10 to 4. I'll be there on that the Saturday and Sunday. 
um, yeah, looking forward to having a book signing in two years and, uh, and what a better place to do it, but in Naples, Florida and the Alamo, if you haven't been to the Alamo, the Alamo is like a country club. It's like a, it, it really <laughs> is. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible indoor shooting facility in, in, uh, in the North part of Naples. It's beautiful. And it's Naples, Florida. Are you kidding me? In March, Naples is beautiful in itself. So I'm excited. I want everybody to come because I'm excited just to get out and finally you kind of start being normal again. So yeah, man, looking forward to it. Thanks for mentioning that. I forgot. I completely forgot. No, it's fine. So yeah, be there guys. If you're in the area, March 13th, March 14th, that's coming right up. Uh, yeah. At the Alamo gun range. Uh, and as always guys, thanks for checking out the show uh, this week and every week. We got a lot of good stuff planned for the, uh, for the rest of this month. And thanks to all of our sponsors who, who keep us going and, uh, have allowed this to become a success at this point. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And sponsors, guys coming on, thank you so much. But if you guys weren't listening to us, we wouldn't have sponsors. So it always goes kudos to you guys out there listening to us. And, and stay motivated, guys. Keep grinding. Keep driving on. When you hit an obstacle, find a way to get through it, get around it, get over it, go under it. But just keep moving forward. Don't let it stop you. Failure is just a chance to, to learn and, and get better. That's all that is. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys out there. That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast, but we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never quit. <laughs>